Hello, everyone, and welcome to Pricing Matters. This time, we're going to chat with a constant in this and somewhat of a celebrity in the pricing world, Kevin Mitchell, the president of the Professional Pricing Society. Hi, Kevin. Thanks for joining. Hey, Gabe. Very good day. Thanks for the opportunity to talk with you today. I am certainly not sure about the celebrity part, but <laughs> we will see what we can do here. But thanks for the opportunity to talk. Yeah, well, you know, I, sometimes I tell people I'm, I'm getting pricing famous, you know, which is not really famous, right? But you're definitely pricing famous. We'll, we'll give you that, right? <laughs> perhaps, uh, perhaps. I know a few people, as do you, of course. So, right, uh, right. Yes, if uh, you have pricing in your job title, there's a chance that we've met or that we know who each other are. Let's say for, that. For sure. It's a small world in pricing, right? So, um, but for those that might not know what a PPS or Professional Pricing Society does or what you do, maybe you can educate the audience a little bit and tell us about it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Gabe, the Professional Pricing Society, PPS, is the world's networking, information, education, certification uh, organization, professional organization. We're a member organization for people in pricing and revenue management and sales enablement, marketing and related fields. And basically, if you are in one of those areas or if you are in pricing, perhaps connected with another discipline, we're the organization where you would go through your membership to get skills, strategies, tactics, uh, acumen to do better at your jobs, um, we do conferences across the globe in non-pandemic years. We would do typically three, four, or five major conferences on two, three, or four continents. Uh, we have publications about pricing. We have a bank of online pricing courses and lots of options for you there. And basically, we are the professional organization for people in this part of the world. Um, PPS has a very long storied, interesting history, and actually it goes back several decades to way before pricing was cool, and <laughs> PPS uh, started as a, a newsletter kind of connected to office hours where you could get in touch with a consultant, you know, via the phone or something like that, and this would have been the early 1980s. And in about 1990, maybe it was 1991, we started doing conferences. And of course, those have grown over the years. And last year, we celebrated our 31st year of doing conferences in North America. We've been doing them in Europe for 15 years. And of course, now in 2020, everything, everything is virtual. But uh, we have made the shift there as well. But basically, very, very long answer to your short question. <laughs> but PPS would be where you would go to network, to train, to get educated, to get a psychological group, group hug from others in your area if this is part of your job. Yeah, excellent. And I mean, just not to toot our own horn, but um, it's also, I would say, at the conferences where a lot of people go to see what's out there in the world of software, pricing optimization software. And, and you, you have a lot of vendors and sponsors that uh, you and normally when you have the exhibition halls that people can go around and get demos and see kind of the latest and greatest of what's out there as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's a big part of our events. And of course, we're doing it virtually as well, too, with uh, virtual software sponsor demonstrations and things like that, yeah. <laughs> excuse me, that are part of our, our, uh, our virtual conferences now. Yeah. But yes, it would have been the place where you would go, you could hear from the big four accounting firms, there are a handful of pricing specific consultancies and adjacent fields. And of course, you know, PriceFX and other companies who have software offerings for pricing, that, that is exactly where you would go in our exhibit hall to see the latest and greatest to get a demonstration, to get all your answers from all of your questions and so on and so forth there. So, yeah. Yeah. So 2020 has been a virtual year. I, you know, I wouldn't have thought I've been to many, many PPS conferences going back to probably, I think 2007, 2008, when I first started getting more involved in pricing and, uh, you know, been to PPS conferences every year. And so, uh, kind of missing it this year, you know, that last one in Las Vegas, I, I wouldn't have thought that that'd be the last time we'd see each other for a while. Running an organization like yours that is heavily focused on events and networking and kind of in-person training and things like that must have been really challenging for you. So can you talk a little bit about how your organization approached um, and kind of adjusted your plan in response to the pandemic and how that's looking and, and how, how you're tracking against that plan? 
Yes, of course. And what you said is 100% right. I think if you would have asked anyone in 2015, where are you going to be in five years? Or if you ask someone in 2019, where are you going to be next year? We all got that question wrong. No one would have <laughs> right. did, uh, that one right at all. And this year, of course, has been an adjustment for PBS because what we are best known for would be our really big major conferences where everyone in our discipline gets together for conference keynotes, breakouts, presentations, our exhibit hall to learn the latest and greatest and things like that. So with this adjustment, and this was really more perspiration than inspiration. I mean, decisions were made for us. This year, an in-person event, as we've been used to for the past 30 years, is simply not going to happen. So I am lucky in that regard and that the PPS team is very experienced, but also we've got enough uh, agility and youth and new ideas where we were able to take our events virtual. And although it's not exactly the same feel as being in a, uh, a, large, hotels, a large hotels ballroom with 556 people all around uh, listening to presentations and getting together and meeting for receptions and things like that, we have been able to, to replicate big parts of that through our virtual events. Um, also, we're lucky as a result of the last big economic shock that we had, you know, the Great Recession of 2007, 2008, 2009, maybe 2010, depending on your industry and geography. We invested heavily in building up our online training options because, again, people lost their travel and training budgets, which is where a lot of our revenue would have come from. Mm -hmm. So we had to make a change back then. And that put us in better stead for this shock to our system. Yeah. Because at least for pricing people, we've got a bank of online training options for you and your team. Um, we're used to doing virtual summits and we're used to doing webinars and things like that. So mm -hmm. we made the shift and had a, a virtual conference you gave an excellent presentation on oh, the future you. of pricing teams. And we had, I believe, 40 speakers, several hundred attendees. And uh, yeah, that just ended. And one of the good things about virtual is it can kind of have that nice long tail. Mm -hmm. So recordings are still available. So even though our event ended a few days ago as we're recording this, uh, it will have a long tail and people can still go back. And if they want, if they missed out live, they can still go back and see the presentations mm -hmm. on demand, you know, on your own schedule. Yeah. Basically we've shifted everything virtual that we can and we're in a pretty good place there. Yeah. yeah and you talked about some of the kind of that the last, uh, you know, recession had kind of prepared you. So, uh, you know, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is there's been some positive outcomes from this, right? Environmental outcomes, you know, uh, more, some people are getting better work-life balance, spending more time with their families. I know me, my, personal situation is, you know, I put probably at 150,000 road miles last year. I've got, you know, a lot less than that this year. Um, I think I had 30,000 uh, between January and March 12th. And uh, I think about five since then, I would just took my first business trip last year, uh, last week out to um, South Carolina of the year. Tell me about from your perspective in the pricing world, in, in your organization, um, you know, what are the positive outcomes? We know about the negative outcomes and, and the, the, you know, the increasing need for agility and digital transformation and things like that. But I'd like to get your take on that. But, but let's start on a positive note and talk about, you know, what you've seen in the pricing industry as a, as a positive outcome of 2020 and the events that have happened. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question and a good point. I think with the pandemic and with this shock to our system, what we're seeing companies do is take a deep breath and rule number one is don't panic. Mm -hmm. And rule number two is kind of remember who you are, remember your pricing strategies, remember who your company is, remember who your customers are, and remember that actions have consequences. And panicked actions can have obviously some very adverse uh, effects down the road. Mm -hmm. And one difference between 2020 and 2009 that I'm seeing from a pricing perspective is back then everyone was under the impression that if we discount more, if we cut our prices, if we throw in a lot of things behind our offer, our margins on a per sale per unit, whatever basis may go down, but our sales will increase and continue to increase and everything will be fine and will be glorious and 
will be mm -hmm. prepared for what's next. And of course, our actions have consequences. And so if I'm Kevin Mitchell and Associates and I drop all of my prices, I think it's gonna get, get my company more volume. Gabe Smith and Associates, my competitor or my compatriot may do the same thing, in which case we're simply kind of shrinking the pie yep. and bowing over smaller and smaller pieces and really costing jobs. And I did see more of that in 2009 that I, than I believe we're seeing now. Yeah. I think now people are adjusting their offerings. They're saying, okay, there might be a separate offering for a more budget conscious customer, consumer, business partner, or something like that. But that doesn't mean that everything just drops to the floor because we have to think, we don't panic. We have to remember that our actions have consequences. And if others follow us down, then we may have started a price war, which hurts yeah. everybody. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you mentioned, um, you know, potential loss in jobs. And, and at least from my perspective, I saw when this first hit, um, there were a fair amount of people getting uh, cut, you know, uh, in across different, you know, uh, disciplines, but and, and different industries, but certainly pricing was not an exception there. And there was, you know, a fair amount of people that, that got uh, either laid out, laid off or, um, you know, uh, kind of, put on hold. Um, I've seen that come back though. It seems like recently, um, at least from some of the, you know, the things that I see online that there's, uh, jobs, people are hiring again. What is your perspective on that? Yeah, I would agree that there were quite a few people who were affected in March, April and May and still are being affected. I mean, we're still seeing some of that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I think that this is a little different in that you're correct with this situation, we do see things starting to come back. People are starting to realize the importance of pricing and revenue management and, and related fields and their effects on your company's bottom line. And I believe that we are seeing as a little bit more critical than we would have 10, 15, 20 years ago with previous shocks. So uh, the job market that I'm seeing right now is a bit of, uh, you know, the standard pyramid approach where people toward the top of that, if you are vice president level, director level, senior director level, something like that, then yes, there might be a longer job search if you were affected in the early days of the pandemic or by a merger acquisition or anything like that. Uh, there do seem to be lots of opportunities with people building their team and enhancing their teams and pricing becoming a part of product management, a part of marketing or finance or a connection to sales. And sometimes it may not be called pricing or it may not be called revenue management. I've seen jobs from companies where I know that they're basically pricing jobs, but they may be called, you know, something on a customer success team, on a margin team or something like that. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of synonymous terms. There is good opportunity, let's say, at the analyst and manager level. Of course, the higher you go up that pyramid, the longer the job search will be, but the rewards will probably be there also. So hopefully we, uh, you know, we're still in the midst of this, of course, but hopefully we're seeing a case where we are not having that big of a bite taken out of the job market for pricing professionals. And there are some new opportunities out there. So I would encourage everyone to stay focused, to look beyond things that simply have the word pricing in the title, job descriptions. A lot of them I know you can look at them and go, this is pretty much a pricing revenue management job, but it may not be called that. Mm -hmm. So um, you definitely stay focused, keep with the opportunities for PPS members and others. You know, we have a jobs board, we have connections on LinkedIn, we have LinkedIn pages where people post jobs. So I would remember to use all the tools available to you if you are in that situation where you are looking for your next opportunity there. Uh, we had the opportunity to have uh, the CEO of a, of a company called Drift. That's a, an engagement marketing platform, a chat uh, kind of bot uh, type of uh, platform. And uh, David Cancel, who's a serial entrepreneur and kind of, you know, somewhat uh, of a celebrity in the startup realm because of that. And one of the things that he had said when I was doing research is that, you know, uh, assume everything that you know is wrong, right? And that's kind of one of the, the things that he always, the, the, what he encourages in his team and, and, and the way that he, you know, brings products to market and adjusts them. And it kind of speaks to that that iterative kind of agile approach um, and the, the kind of lean startup approach to, to how you 
um, you know, don't make a lot of assumptions. Don't, um, there's an old saying in, in product management where, where I come from is your opinion while interesting is irrelevant, right? It's kind of along the same line. So I, I, I asked him, do you think that applies to pricing? And he said, yes, and kind of explained how he thought it, it did. But I, I wanted to kind of get your take on that as someone that's kind of deeper in the, in the pricing profession. Yeah, that's very interesting. And I do think there is a lot of correct thinking in believing that things that you were, or things that you believed or things that worked in the 20th century would still apply now, because of course, in a lot of cases, they don't. And from a pricing perspective, some of the things that we've already touched on that have been part of the business canon for years, we realize, you know, may not be 100% the case. I believe that probably all of us at one point or another had an economics course or econ 101 or a microeconomics course where we had the downward sloping demand curve from the Northwest to the Southeast with price on the Y axis and with quantity or sales or volume or whatever on the X axis. Mm -hmm. And so for years we were taught that essentially you could drop price to increase demand or increase sales. And if you look at it from an industry-wide perspective, there's certainly some truth to that depending on the comparisons and depending on the replacements that are available in your industry. But on an individual company basis, of course, that very well might not be true. I mean, there are a lot of cases where people were at this point on that axis and they think, oh, I'll drop five, I'll drop price five or 10%, I'll sell five or 10% more. And of course, one of the caveats there is that will almost always put you in a worse position, even if it's true, and oftentimes it's not true, because right. of competitive response, because of you know, your customer's valuation of what's going on, and because there are a lot of things that go on in the behavioral economics and in the brain here where it doesn't work, where gee, I can simply create demand by dropping price. Right, right. It's not a, it's not competitors a, will do the same thing and so on and so forth. Right. So there's, yeah, there's definitely a, a game theory aspect to, to that. And in a B2B environment, it's a much more complex decision. Purchasing behavior is not just driven by price. Unlike, so in a, a more simple commoditized B2C type of environment, that may be the case. And, but it's, it's much more than just an economic issue, right? It, it's, as you mentioned, behavioral, psychological, there's a relationship aspect. There's things like derived demand and B2B that you know, mean that there's not going to be an increase in demand for my product just because I lower the price. They need what they need. And it's then it's about the competitive response. And then, yeah, as you mentioned, a lot of times you end up with that race to the bottom and you're just driving the margin out of the business. And it's, it is very hard to even break even a lot of times by reducing price. And, um, you know, one of the things that software platforms like ours help track is, you know, what the, that response is and kind of feed that back into the pricing to, you know, to make adjustments um, faster than you can, you know, without it. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely with you on that. Um, so one of the things that we often talk about is we talk about pricing as a journey, right? And, and we, we, and that it can always be improved, you know, a la Kanban or, you know, kind of continuous improvement from manufacturing. You can apply those same techniques, uh, to pricing and think about, you know, okay, I got better. You know, there's kind of a multiple levels of, and, and we often talk about it as, as this journey and with multiple levels in it. Um, can you explain, uh, to the audience about how, Professional Pricing Society and, and uh, that your organization helps pricers improve their their uh, skills and and help guide companies along that journey and take them to those higher levels of you know the promised land of you know the types of gains and can you talk about maybe some some of your experience or or what you've seen in terms of the gains from price optimization uh, and and from you know getting better at this and improving it over time? Yes, absolutely. There are quite a few different ways that my organization and others in our space can help with that. One, from professional pricing society standpoint, from a PPS standpoint, we're lucky in that since we've been in this part of the business world for decades, plural now, that we have connections to the thought leaders, to the experts to the academics, to the consultants, to the software companies, to the senior practitioners, basically to everyone in this space. And in a lot of cases, we use specific experts as faculty for our training programs. So 
all of our events, all of our conferences, whether they're in person or virtual, or you know, perhaps in the next couple of years, a hybrid type of approach, will always have full day workshops, which will go deep in depth on specific issues within pricing. Uh, it could be pricing and sales. It could be revenue management and corporate success. It could be on analytics. It could be on negotiations and so on and so forth there. And so through our training initiatives, we offer people basically a chance to plot their own path and decide which issues are most important to them. And basically we have a bank of opportunities, a lot of options for you to basically plot your own path, pick which options are best for you and do training on your schedule and do it in the way that's best for you. And with, Right now, I believe we are around 55 online pricing courses. We add them all the time, of course. And that's in addition to the dozens upon dozens that we would offer at our events, connected with our events through workshops and things like that. So all in all, we probably have 100 options every year that are, that are available for revenue management professionals, professionals mm -hmm. to train and to gain expertise there. Um, you know, some other ways that we look at improving knowledge and basically raising the skill level of pricing people is that PPS also has certifications, plural now. Uh, our main certification for revenue and for pricing is CPP, Certified Pricing Professional. And this involves a good amount of work. Usually when people finish it, I get an email or a LinkedIn message for them. They're like, I finished it, now I'm tired, now I'm gonna go back and uh, take a break and go back to my job. But basically our certifications involve six specialized workshops or online training classes around specific issues. Each of them have testing involved. And after that, you get study guides, extra reading materials, practice tests, uh, a study group, access to an academic advisor and a lot of things. And then we start to prepare you for the CPP, the Certified Pricing Professional final exam. Mm -hmm. which covers 11 modules in pricing, covers everything soup to nuts, and basically is a great way to show depth and breadth and a great way to show that you're going above and beyond the call, uh, a great way to enhance your own career aspirations for your management to show your dedication to the discipline and also for your company a way to show results and to improve results there. And one interesting thing that, and I would imagine you have this issue as well, that my team and I have is we look at pricing as a way to increase your margins and your profitability. And sometimes we talk basis points, but sometimes we also talk percentage points. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us are aware, if you're not, then I have information here. But if you are able to increase your price effectiveness by a few basis points or maybe a few percentage points, the impact of that on your bottom line is multiplied over and over depending on your contribution margins, of course. For an average Fortune 1000 company, a 1% increase in your pricing effectiveness, basically selling things for a dollar and one cent instead of a dollar, everything else staying the same, would increase the average Fortune 1000 company's profitability by 10 or 11%. And in some industries, it's a lot, lot more. Mm -hmm. So the effect there, the rewards there are there. Of course, it's not easy to do through our organization and through others, through systems and software like PriceFX and others. There are ways that you can improve there, but it's very important that you definitely try to undertake those journeys. So yeah, I would challenge everyone, even if you don't have people with revenue or pricing or margin in their job titles, they could be sales managers, but still they probably make pricing decisions for a significant part of their day and their week. And hey, that flows through to your bottom line. So it's very important Absolutely. to do lots of things that you can do there. And yeah, I would challenge everyone to investigate the opportunities through my company, through your company, and through others that are out there. Yeah, I think that's that's a great overview. So uh, you talked a little bit about the, the the virtual conference you just did on the on the future of pricing. Um, and uh, yeah, I talked a little bit about that in in Las Vegas. Actually, I had I was talking about the future of kind of commerce and the future of pricing. And uh, you know, I, I thought it was a it was 
cool to be able to expand on the, on, on the topic, um, in this last, you know, event. And I, as you mentioned, I focused on the future of pricing teams. So I just, you know, after having attended that, you probably saw more of the sessions than I did. Um, can you talk about what you see in the future of pricing and the future of the pricing profession and kind of now and into the future and how maybe that's uh, been accelerated a little bit this year um, or, or kind of how the pandemic is playing into that? Yeah, definitely. And first of all, your presentation was great. And I was lucky I kind of nominated myself to be the moderator of your session. So I got to, to, to participate in it live with you. So I was thankful for the opportunity there. And I would remind everyone that if you did register for the PPS Fall Virtual Conference, or if you would like to, to definitely make sure to check out Gabe's presentation on the future of pricing teams there, because he had some great things around digital opportunities, around the physical makeup of teams, and some great information there. And some other things that I think we are going to see coming up is with pricing's importance, and it's interesting there because senior management will continue to do what senior management got to become senior management if they're left alone. But in a lot of cases, their boards and their Wall Street analysts and others are challenging them to focus not only on top line sales, but more on bottom line profitability. And of course, the juicy middle in between where you talk about margins and things like that. And because of this focus, we do hope to see more opportunities and more challenges for pricing and pricing adjacent teams. So as a result of that, we certainly want to move in a direction where pricing and revenue and margin, you know, these terms become part of a company's DNA. They become part of a company's culture. They become part of a company's processes. In addition to just saying how much, how much of our widget can we sell? It becomes, you know, how much of our widget can we sell at what price? What's going to be the competitive response? What's going to be the market response? What effect is this going to have on our bottom line? Just not how many tons of widgets can we get out the door this quarter? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I would challenge everyone there. And some next steps would be involved using your internal data, using marketplace data, using customer data and many others there to make the decisions that are best for you and your company, not only in the short term, but definitely think medium and long term as well. Mm -hmm. And pricing needs more corporate investment going forward. You know, this could be in people, it could be in systems, it could be in software, it could be in processes, it could be in training, career development. We need career paths and things like that. So I think that's also one thing that we're going to see in the future around this discipline. And with that, of course, there are a lot of challenges. Yeah. And pricing people, if we had a, uh, <laughs> let's say, if we had a connotation or if people made assumptions about us in general, it might be, you know, very good at analytics, buried in, in data, buried in spreadsheets, buried in pricing software, Maybe not so much with the change management, soft selling skills, salesmanship, uh, connections with others, and so on and so forth. And that has to change. We have to be artists and scientists going forward. So, uh, yeah, we will need connections with sales, with marketing, with finance and operations and others there. And we really have to look at becoming an introductory step that that comes much sooner and much earlier in the product management process mm -hmm. all around. And so, yeah, there are a lot of opportunities. There are a lot of changes, um, of course, from a consumer marketplace and sometimes in B2B as well. There are lots of changes around uh, ownership versus usership. And that was another one of the great presentations that, uh, that we had in our event where if you are of my generation, for example, you know, you were brought up that you want to own the big house and the big car and you want to own this and have all of these things. And now what we're seeing with generations that are younger than mine and maybe my generation as well is really it's more what can these things do for me? Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily want to have all of these things. I want what these things do. You know, I don't want the, uh, in the old Deming uh process. You know, I don't want to own the hammer and the nail. I want a series of holes or something like that. Mm -hmm. And of course that changes how we do products and that changes how we do pricing where it's yeah. not necessarily my widget. Now it's 
my widget services or software or data feeding back into you, feeding back in a couple different directions instead of just owning the widget itself. So yeah, lots of changes, lots of things happening in the future. And uh, yeah, we are definitely in a transition there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, and we saw a lot of those changes play out early on in, in the software industry and in our industry, you know, and uh, one of the reasons for our, for our success has really been that we, you know, we just really focused on being cloud native and, and just all in on that and all in on SaaS. And we don't have a lot of the, you know, the, the baggage that comes along with having a, you know, on premise and, you know, people owning the software and having a certain expectation around that. Uh, so it just has really huge implications to not only the way that you price, but the way that you service customers, the way that you develop products, the way that you can roll them out. Uh, it's really massive in terms of that. And I think, you know, speaking of software, one of the things that I, I said in the um, in my talk about pricing teams was um, that uh, I think all softwares, all companies are becoming software companies to some extent, right? And, I, and I'd say that, you know, in pricing specifically, you know, we are seeing, I think, more and more usage of, you know, AI, of analytics, of uh, embedding software in the quote to cash process to make it more efficient, be able to move faster. Um, and, and so do you think that's true? I mean, do you think that that's going to be an increasingly uh, uh, important component of, of pricing professionals is to not only understand how to do the analytics, but also, you know, the other thing I was talking about is like, it's about does like figuring out what the model to build and what data to have and, and figuring out that piece, not necessarily what problem to solve. It's not about putting numbers into an Excel sheet and coming out with a solution. It's about figuring out, you know, what the, what the problems are to solve now and how that's going to change in the future and how do I de develop the right capabilities as an organization because a lot of the problem solving is going to be more and more done by machines, right? Right. Yeah, that's true. And I love the statement that all companies are software companies. It's just a question of whether or not they realize it or where they are along that, uh, that slope there. But yes, that's happening. And in addition to software as a service, you know, I'm hearing pass instead of SAS, the product as a service. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't even know how to pronounce it, but X A A S, anything and everything as a service. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more around servitization. Servitization, that was a hard one for me. <laughs> and uh, around software. And yes, eventually all companies will have that as part of their DNA, as part of their processes. And, you know, hey, it's 2020 now. Yeah. If you have not gotten into a basic e-commerce, then uh, there are a lot of bricks and mortar companies that are unfortunately probably seeing huge declines in favor of those that are. Yeah. So yes, that connection is simply in the 2020s is going to be the way that we do business. Yeah, I think also, I, I also kind of view 2020 as the the year of direct to consumer in many regards, right? You'd already seen, had seen some of these trends happening and more omni-channel focus for, you know, traditional companies that may have sold through more traditional channels in the past. But um, I mean, you're seeing a massive expansion and investment in, in direct to consumer business models. And I think that has huge implications to pricing. You know, we, a lot of times we talk about, oh, there's B2B pricing over here and there's B2C pricing over here. Well, that, that whole distinction is going away, right, in my opinion. And it's going to be, you know, figure out where, and it's really about customer focus, right? To go back to what David Cancel had said, the, the reason why you want to assume everything that you know is wrong is because you should really be talking to the customers about what they want, where they want to buy, what the value is, how, what pricing strategies make sense for that. And it, and it can vary by depending on, you know, where you are, right? And, and I, I definitely agree that the move from, you know, software as a service or anything as a service, it's really about value, right? One of the terms I've heard is value as a service, right? And, and so how do you align, how do you understand that customer value? How do you, um, you know, price, come up with products and services that, that align to that and then price them accordingly. And I think companies that are able to do that and have that as like a premise and be very customer focused and customer centric, um, they have an easier time in this kind of multi multidisciplinary aspect that you were talking about before and having those relationships. Um, because if everyone's focused on the customer and, 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 you know, and understanding all of these things about them, then 
you're going to relate better as an organization because you're all focused on that, right? Versus in some organizations, it's like, okay, you know, sales and customer success or customer service is uber focused on the customer, but then finance and operations and, you know, other organizations are more focused on the dollars over here and they're not all, you know, singing off the same hymn sheet and it causes a lot of conflict, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's interesting there. What's interesting there is that the customer and their valuation of our goods and services needs to come earlier and earlier in all of our thought processes. And where an old, an older manufacturing company may have said, okay, we've made this machine and now we go out and market it. Now we go out and sell it. And then we kind of see what works and maybe change the processes there based on customer feedback for version 2.0 and for the next one down the road. Now that's going to kind of be reversed where everything's got to start basically outside in from the company's perspective, where it has to start with, we know our customers, we can talk with our customers. We need to really figure out what our customers would value and then determine if it makes sense for us to build it and see where it would be in our product line and see where it is in our placement and see how we promote it and things like that. So really it's a case where that thinking has to come a lot earlier. And this is a case where revenue managers have a great deal to offer there because through their research and through their discussions with the customer base, they may have a great initial idea of, okay, for our last product group, we found out that our customer base really valued features and benefits A, B, and C, but we put all of our effort into D, E, and F. Mm -hmm. So if we can start thinking that way and move it earlier in the process, really it might do a better job of addressing addressing customer valuation, which of course affects everything from the top to the bottom all the way down. So Yeah. yeah, I would agree with that there. Cool. So we talked a lot about the pandemic and its impacts in 2020. Uh, Another, uh, uh, you know, I think movement or another um, kind of issue at the forefront of kind of society this year has been around the Black Lives Matter movement. And uh, I don't want to get overly political. And I know this is a charged topic, but, you know, you you are a black leader in a diverse organization. And uh, I was interested to get your take on uh, what you've seen. Um, this year and and kind of leading up to it um, around this and if you've seen um, impacts in the the pricing world um, or professional world in in general Um, and you know so I'd I'd love to get your your perspective on that. Yeah definitely and thanks for the opportunity to talk about that Gabe and I think one thing that's interesting is I see Black Lives Matter and I see what's going on in America and around the world in 2020 as really more of a human rights issue than a specific political issue. Mm -hmm. And I think in our country, obviously we have kind of a uh, a cyclical thing where, you know, we've gone from slavery to Jim Crow to open and outright discrimination to the fight for rights to more recent attempts at equity and equality. And with each of these steps, Obviously, there are a lot of people fighting for the changes, and also there are quite a few people on the wrong side of history who are fighting against these changes as well. And specifically, I think you can see Black Lives Matter as the next step in a human rights that follows these things from America's history and from the world's history as well. And a few things specifically about the Black Lives Matter movement and about some of the other protests is that I could offer a very simple statement. The police are coming. Unfortunately, that statement might mean something completely different to a completely innocent Black or Native or Latin American person than it may to a completely innocent otherwise similar white person and it does and that's wrong and i think that that's the gist of it and really that's a kind of a human rights issue it's Mm -hmm. let's treat human beings like human beings uh this would go back you know a 12 year old kid wearing a hoodie eating candy walking home if he's black would not provoke 
any more of a response than a 12 year old white kid wearing a hoodie, eating candy, walking home should, but obviously we have cases where it does. So a very touchy issue really about human rights and seeing the equality and looking for equity in circumstances and realizing that this is a case where we are not being treated equally as human beings and we should be. So politics aside, let's think more human rights than a political this yeah. side versus that side or one side versus the other. Um, you know, politics, we have enough there with uh, what should go on in other parts of our economy and our world. But on this one, yeah, let's let's think of this one as a more human rights issue. Yeah, and absolutely. Being treated as human beings. Absolutely. And, and I think, uh, you know, I, unfortunately, things do get politicized, and that's why I made that statement. I, I agree with you that it is fundamentally a human rights issue. And um, the one, though, that I also wanted to get your take on is, have you seen uh, impacts of systemic racism or impacts of Black Lives Matter in the, in the pricing profession, in, in what you've seen in terms of, um, have you seen, I mean, one thing that I've noticed is that there's been more uh, high-profile moves to um, you know, in leadership uh, and kind of a more focus in, on diversity recently. Um, and I mean, part, there's a PR aspect to that, unfortunately, right? But, 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 uh, but it's, it is progress nonetheless, right? So, so um, I guess uh, there's, that's, that's positive in, in many ways. So I, I'm just curious to get your take on it since you have kind of a broad perspective across the pricing profession um, and also as, as a leader yourself. Yeah, thanks. Thanks again for the opportunity there. And from a business perspective, obviously, we still have underrepresented groups. And of course, in our pyramid, as we go up, that becomes more and more of an issue as we go higher and higher up that pyramid. And we have also seen that organizations that are more, quote, diverse, unquote, than similar organizations that are less so, typically perform better. And of course the reasons should be apparent. It's because you get more viewpoints instead of everyone kind of playing along to the same type of thinking or something like that. I mean, getting thought processes and getting expertise from others who are not like us is a good thing. And mm -hmm. I would definitely challenge anyone that would tend to disagree with, with that. And yeah, that one should be fairly easy to, uh, to discern for yourself. But in the business world, still we have situations where with underrepresented groups, there is a lot more opportunity. And I would challenge leaders to go outside of their own bubbles when searching for their next leaders and for people who are gonna take their organizations forward. Uh, there was a horrible statement from someone, I think it may have been a CEO of one of our major banks and this individual said that they had a very hard time finding minority talent in their organization, you know, promotable, promotable minority talent. And I was thinking, well, if that's your viewpoint, then yes, it probably would become a self-fulfilling pro prophecy, mm -hmm. so to speak. And the next leaders may not come from your alma mater. They may not habitate in your social circles. They may not do the things that you do, go to the places that you go, but they're certainly out there. And a statement that there's no minority talent out there in 2020 is absolutely ridiculous. So I would challenge everyone to get outside of their usual processes. Uh, obviously there are great organizations, you know, National Hispanic MBA, National Black MBA, and others. There are HBCUs, historically, black colleges and universities that have great computer science and engineering training programs where a very high percentage of the next generation's leaders are going to come from. So if that's not part of your recruiting, then it should be going forward. And there are lots of opportunities for people out there to do better. And that is to get different viewpoints and just keep this in mind. Business people, salespeople, marketing people, senior leaders, we like to think of ourselves as being competitive. We want to win. 
And if we ourselves don't go out there and look for that next generation, our competitors likely will. And if we are more homogenized and they are more diverse, if they have more female representation and uh, you know, underrepresented people, higher ups on their boards as senior leaders, then down the road, what's that gonna mean for your competitive nature going forward? I mean, right. this is a way to improve. This is, this is not something that should be done as a PR move, even though in a lot of cases we'll take what we can get, but this is a human nature business competitive move. If yeah. you are removing yourself from a significant part of the population and looking for your hiring and your next level employees, then you are limiting yourself going forward, plain and yeah. simple. Yeah, I mean, I, I think diversity breeds strength and, and uh, you know, it, it comes, a lot of it comes down to that customer focus as well, right? Your customers are probably diverse. The world is diverse, increasingly diverse, right? So the people within your organization that are, you know, trying to make decisions to, on how to serve that market should also reflect that market. You're going to get better decisions as a result and better performance as has been shown. So I'm with you on that. Um, so uh, we're, we're about out of time. Is there anything else that you'd like to add kind of in, in conclusion? Yeah, always good to talk with you, Gabe. I appreciate the opportunity here. And uh, for specific issues that need to be addressed, I mean, let's, let's address them. Uh, from a business pricing perspective, I would certainly encourage everyone that these are tough times. But in tough times with more pressure on your margins, that potential 10 basis points, 1% improvement in, price, in pricing, be it through your systems, software, your processes, your people, that gets magnified when things get tough. If your margins are squeezed, then Gabe Smith and Kevin Mitchell can tell you ways to work. So make sure to take advantage of us, others like us around this part of the business world and take advantage of what we have to offer there. Uh, certainly would encourage everyone that in a lot of cases, when things tell from a business perspective, the first thing to go is training, recruitment, human resources, you know, kind of looking at the next level of where your next leaders are going to come from. And that to me is a very definition of being penny wise and pound foolish, because that's going to leave you a big hole. And businesses, we do have to survive. So we do have to be smart about our spending and we do have to think about the next steps there. But uh, the old adage I've heard, uh, you know, what if we train our people and they leave and go somewhere else? Well, the counterpart of that is what if we don't train our people and they stay? What if we <laughs> right. don't improve our systems, our processes, and we're using, uh, you know, the old monochrome green and white systems 20 years from now and things like that. You've got to stay current. You've got to stay up on what's going on and you have to do business. And a lot of times when there's a shock to our system, as there is now, we tend to think very, very, very short term. And we have to in some cases. We have to survive and make sure that we can breathe and eat tomorrow and next week and next month. But this will end as all other shocks have and will in the future. There will be more shocks. And remember that our companies have long lifelines, we have strategies, we have value built up with our customer databases, we have things that we provide to the marketplace or we wouldn't be around. And we're going to have to continue doing those and building on those. And we're going to have to continue to not only survive this quick shock to our system, but we're going to have to thrive in periods down the road. So it's easy to be short term focused, but I would challenge all of us to remember a medium term and a long term are coming and the way things are going, they will be here before we, we know it. So yeah. thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely. Apologies about my long soliloquy there, but no yeah, problem. Gabe, thanks for the opportunity to talk with you and looking forward to more episodes of your, uh, your podcast here. So I'm looking forward to seeing what's next. All right. Thanks a lot, Kevin. And thanks so much for attending Pricing Matters.